Hey guys, what's up? Eddie Alho here with KissAndLock.com. All right, what I'm going to do today is bring you over here to the computer, well, the scope on the computer, uh, the Pico scope, and I'm going to show you a bunch of waveforms so that after this video, I hope you have a really good feel for how the buck converter works, and yeah. So you know what? I'm going to first start off with the board, okay? My trusty board. So I got a lot of stuff on here. Uh, basically, the buck regulator, the, the main machine, the switching fat, the uh, flyback dial, let's call it, the inductor and the output capacitor. Well, and also an input capacitor. And I have a control chip that I just marked with an asterisk. Okay? Now, so the main thing about this uh, buck converter is that we have to know what the duty cycle is. And that depends on what the input and output voltage is going to be. Because the output voltage is just a fraction, it's a ratio of the input to output voltage and duty cycle. So duty cycle is equal to the output voltage divided by input voltage. So if we have 10 volts in and we want 5 volts out, then that's half the voltage. So we want the switch on for half the time. Now, the switch is going to have some voltage drop, the inductor is going to have some voltage drop, the diode is going to have some voltage drop. So it's not exactly, but you know what I mean. It's pretty close. It's a good place to start. So uh, the first thing we want to know is the duty cycle when we design one of these things. And then that helps us decide what size of inductor and all that stuff to use. Okay. In this case, we have the specs for this little board over here that we're going to be testing. The input voltage has uh, got a minimum of 6.5 to 60 volts it can run on. The output it can provide is 1.25 to 30 volts. And it says I max at 10 amps. I think that's a peak value, and I'm not sure exactly what input and output ratio that that works at. Uh, I have to look into that, spend some more time to see where that max actually occurs. But anyway, it's run by the control chip, the LT3800. So it's Linear Technology 3800 chip. Uh, linear Technology now owned by Analog Device. Okay, And it has a switching frequency of 200 kilohertz fixed. So this controller has a fixed frequency. Some are variable or you can adjust them or set them to what you want within a range. And uh, the time, the period of a cycle is going to be 1 over the switching frequency. So 5 microseconds. All right? So... Once we know the duty cycle is, based on our input and output voltage, this uh, the output voltage of this thing is adjustable within that range. I've adjusted it for 5 volts for this demonstration, okay? So, for a 5 volt and a 10 volt in, in the case of, I've got three different cases here. I'm going to take you through more cases than that over here. But, basically, these three ranges. So, right here where the input voltage is twice the output voltage, roughly, then we get 50% duty cycle. The time on is the same as the time off. And in this case, we're going to have uh, 6.25 volts in, which is about 80%. Actually, it's going to be a little bit above that. I just wanted to put 80% duty cycle down, which came out to 6.25. And we need at least 6.5 to run. But I just want to show you, when we start getting the voltage real low, it's going to be this long ramp time to try to average five volts at the output and then a short off time and the peak current is less because we don't have as much voltage pushing uh, current to the inductor so it it only needs 227 milliamps to maintain this critical conduction which I didn't really point out over here you know where the inductor just barely starts running out of current when it ramps up again when the next cycle starts uh, 568 milliamps for this case 227 for this case and this guy it's gonna let's say we have 25 volts in to get the 20 percent duty cycle then it needs yeah 909 milliamps so now the voltage across the inductor is the 25 at the input minus the 5 at the output so when the switch is on we have 25 here 5 here and now we have 20 in this case we only had 2 point well 1.25 because we had 6.25 here 5 here so 1.25 volts across the inductor. And in this one, we had the 5 volts. 10 volts here, 5 volts here. Now this is the switching node. Remember, that's a very important part.
part of the circuit. That's where we can get noise in that because it's bouncing all the way from when the switch is turned on, it's being pulled up to that voltage. And when it's off, this diode provides a function that allows current to keep on flowing to the inductor. So current's flowing to the inductor, getting charged up. FET turns off, oh, keeps on flowing, but it's discharging. Okay, so that's the function of the diode. All right, now right here in the middle where I have these equations, uh, once we know duty cycle, the volts out divided by volts in, then we can calculate what the time on is because now we can take that fraction, 50%, 80 or 20, and multiply it by the T, the five microseconds. So in this case, half of it, so it'd be 2.5 microseconds for this one. In this case, it's 20%. 20% of five is one microsecond. So it's only on for one microsecond, then off for four microsecond. So you kind of see what I'm getting to is the duty cycle really controls what your output voltage is gonna be based on your input. Okay, so once you have all that figured out, now this board over here, by the way, also has a 22 micro Henry inductor. Now I read that inductance when there's no load on it, so it's gonna be the max inductance. Uh, once we put a load through it, generally they drop, and I'm gonna show you that in another video when we choose the inductor for our own design, uh, how we do that, but you know, let's say it's going to drop 10%. Maybe it's only 20 microhenry when you actually have it load. Now, depending on how much current you put on it, and depending on what kind of inductor it is, then that can drop even more, okay? And if you put too much current through, like if this peak of the current gets too high, this guy can actually saturate, right? It's like a sponge. You can uh, put a magnetic field into it only so much, keep on putting current, the field builds up and builds up until it can't hold any more field. And it's like a big old sponge, you just pour more juice on it, pretty soon that juice just runs all over and falls on the ground because the sponge is full. And that's what happens with the inductor. It just shorts and all the current just goes to the output. And that's not a good thing because, you know, that can damage whatever circuitry you have over here because now you have your VN say in this case 25 volts and it's a short when this switch is on you get 25 volts over here that's not a good thing so yeah you don't want that to ever happen so you got to pick that inductor carefully okay the other thing you want to pick it for your ratio of ripple current you know uh, I reviewed this book last week Sanjaya Maniktalia and uh, this was the, actually the first edition I reviewed the second edition and the third edition is free but it's it's an addition to the second it's kind of the more advanced uh, portions of book number two but book number one book number two I've got links for those two uh, yeah I recommend this book it's a great book uh, so Sanjaya came up with the 40 percent ripple current versus your your overall current at your output so let's just say make math easy if you had 10 amps on the output 40% of that is 4 amps, so you have 2 amps up and 2 amps down, and you'd have a, you know, so maximum 40, you have 4 amps here, peak to peak, okay? Now, the DC average of these waveforms is just half the value of the peak. So what I'm going to show you over here is if you need more current than what this average value would be, then... It's just going to, these peaks are not going to change shape. They're just going to flow on top of whatever current you need at the output. Okay, so uh, the current, if you need, say, 10 amps out here, then this peak-to-peak -peak current is going to be lifted by whatever it is. If, if you have an average current here of 1 amp, you're going to have 9 amps here, and this guy's going to be on top of that. Okay, so that's an important thing to think about. Now, Here's a really important equation before we come over here and get on the computer or get on the scope. <laughs> um, voltage is equal to inductance times change of current divided by change of time. Now, since we know a lot of these uh, variables in this, it's kind of like Ohm's law. Ohm's law has three variables, right? You got resistance, voltage, and current. Well, in this one we have four, four things that can vary. But inductance isn't going to vary because we have that, okay? 
voltage, once we set one of these examples, we can say, okay, we know what the voltage is. And change of time is not going to change because now that we know what the voltage is and the output voltage is, then we can calculate the time on. Okay, so what we want is to solve for change of current. So what we do is we cross multiply, cross divide, whatever. So we want change of current by itself. So we divide both sides by L. That gets rid of this L, puts L over here. And we multiply both sides by a change of time. That gets rid of it here, crosses out. It ends up over here. And we get change of current is equal to that stuff. Okay? Well, and that's how I calculated this stuff. So I just put 22 microhenries here. I put... Now the voltage, remember this is, we're calculating for time on, so it's, in this case, it's 10 volts minus 5 volts, that's the, the voltage across the inductor during this charge time, and during this charge time, it's 6.25 minus 5, so it's only 1.25, that's why it's charging so slow, and then in this one, it charges real fast because it's 25 minus 5, so it charges real fast. Okay, I want to bring up another very important subject. Um, sometimes, often actually, I calculate it the other way. I calculate this current, the ramp current down, because we know what the voltage is on the output. So when this uh, switch turns off and this diode pulls this end down to ground, well, about a diode drop below ground actually, because remember this is plus in comparison to this. So when this is conducting, this is... Uh, 0.7 volts or say 0.4 volts if it's a shock key something like that it's 0.4 volts less than this right so this is more negative so you're going to see it on the scope over here okay but that's a small voltage usually you know, I mean you can take that into your calculation uh, when you're calculating it the way I'm going to show you during the off time but, like, especially if the output voltage is, say, 12 volts, then that's negligible. It's not going to really affect the equation too much. But generally, during the off time, during the discharge time, your out, the voltage across the inductor is your output voltage. Okay? So you take your output voltage, and now you need to know what the time is during the off time. Well, it's just the time minus the on time. So it's, it's a 1 minus D. You know, and that's your off time duty cycle. So you take your off time duty cycle, multiply it by five microseconds, and use that for your change of time, and use your output voltage for V and your inductance, and you can solve for current. It's going to be the same peak current. It's it's just a different voltage across it during the discharge time. In this case, it's the same, but in these other cases, they're different. Anyway, that's just two different ways to solve the same equation. It can be confusing if you're not aware of that because you might see someone else using one of one or the other equation and you're and it confuses you because you haven't seen it before. So I just want to throw that out there, okay? All right, let's come over here and I'm going to change a bunch of things and you're going to watch this happen, okay? Now, if the currents if the average current on the load is less than any one of these things, then what happens is the choke runs out of current, there's some dead time, and that's where you're discontinuous, right? When it's discontinuous, the switching node doesn't have current flowing in it anymore, so it just bounces up, and it's just flapping in the breeze, and you usually see it oscillate up and down until it kind of settles down to whatever the voltage it's tied to here is. And one reason it bounces around and the oscillation, if you want to calculate that, is you do have some capacitance across the FET, and you also have capacitance on the diode, so you can have uh, I mean, it can be kind of weird, but anyway, you get these connections, so it's not totally, when it first bounces up, it's charging capacitors, you know, once the capacitor, and then it dampens, so, you know, it charges them, discharges, and slowly dampens out, but at first it's a resonant thing, so we'll see that too, okay? Let's come over, look at all this stuff, and see what it actually looks like in real life, okay? <laughs> Hey guys, it's the 4th of July here in the uh, United States. Well, it actually was. I ended up having to make some changes to the video, so I'm putting it out late. But that's why I was wearing the shirt, because I started it off on the 4th. I thought I was going to have it out on the 4th, and I missed. Yeah, sorry. But 
Um, but I hope you like it, and let's jump in the video. All right, guys, I'll just show you a quick uh, view of the setup. I'm using this Hioki to do some monitoring with leads there, and I've got this active load here, which I'll have to do a review on this though load. This is a new one I got. I've done one on a, one very similar, so I've got the connections here. I'm not doing a lot of current, so it's no big deal. I'm just kind of running this over to the output of the converter here, and my input voltage is coming here. You can see the leads running up there to the power supply. And I've got the MIG-SIG current probe on here. And then I've got the differential probe from the Pico on this. This is a switching node. This is a ground on the output. And then I'm also using this differential probe set from Pico to look at the output. And then that's uh, the Pico scope. I've got a whole bunch of probes because I was doing a probe comparison. The Pico scope. So yeah, it's a little jumbled mess there. And then I've got the Pico scope here on my Macintosh. Uh, I can run on this app I can run it either on the Mac side or the PC side so I've got PC software running on this as well Microsoft Windows so alright guys here we are on Pico 6 software okay now this on the left side of the screen here we have the amp scale and you can see zero amps right here where my cursor is and that's the blue trace here okay and the trigger point is right here on, I, I just stuck right here in the middle. I can bring it down here and, or I could even trigger on the voltage. Maybe I should do that because the voltage has a nice straight line. So I'll do that and I'll trigger right here in the middle. Okay. So you can see the starting points right here, ramps up and then the transistor turns off. So it ramps down. So this is a switching node, the green one. And on the right over here, we can see the voltage scale. So it goes from zero. And actually you can see it goes, you know, that dial drop below, right? It goes just below zero. Okay. It's about four volts per scale here. And at the top here, let's just pull a cursor down, I guess, actually. Let's pull the first one down to right here where we can see where it drops down to. And it's about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 volts. I probably have a little bit low. There's a peak right there. Now, as it turns on and off, there's a little bit of switching noise. So, yeah, you can see up here it's about 0.7 volts. Okay, let's get the other cursor to the top. Now, this, when it turns on, it applies the input voltage minus the drop across the transistor right there at the switching node. So right here we have 11.11 .11, and that gives us right around 50% duty cycle you see down here. Let's see average. Yeah, right about 50% duty cycle. Um, and here's our peak to peak current, the blue. It is on average about 666 milliamps and DC average is about 262 milliamps. You know what? Oh, well here... One thing I want to do is let's go up to probe A here. It's a Mixig CP2100B I've got connected. And let's go down and and put a filter on it, 1 megahertz, because we're switching at 200K. So that way it cleans up that noise and we can kind of see how it's just barely almost going down to zero, not quite. The DC average is just above half of what the peak to peak is because it's just above that zero line. All right. Here, if I just zoom in on that real quick, we can take a look at that. The zero amps is right here on this scale. And you can see it's it sometimes bounces down there, sometimes above. The green one is over here on the right, and it's actually, yeah, right down at least this end of it is between 0.03 and 0.7 right there you see it's right about there uh okay well let's just you know let's move this box over to the other side Did you see that little dip right there so if i move this cursor right about there now you come up here it's about minus uh 640 millivolts okay let's uh zoom back to normal okay we got our cursor set up now 
And yeah, so there you go. There's our 50% duty cycle, 10 volts in. Well, really about 11 volts in. And the voltage out is actually about 5.2. Yeah, we're just a little bit above in both cases, but that's okay. And that kind of shows what we're trying to look at. And we see the current here, right? Now watch as I bring the current up a little bit. You'll see that shape doesn't change. It just rises up from zero. Okay, I'm gonna go up to 0.5 amps. Okay, there's 0 0.5. If you look down here, it says 0 0.5, so it agrees with my load. And let me get this back on a zero note right there. There's zero right there. And we'll get this guy over here back on zero too. Okay, so yep, here's our zero. You can see it's floating up above. There's 0 0.2, 0 0.2 something. Here's 0 0.4 up here. And that wave shape did not change with the current, right? I'll go up to one amp and you can watch. It just, it doesn't change. Now once we go up to one amp, it's automatically going to rescale. You see it's trying to rescale. So I'm going to go ahead and drop it back down. I could turn this scope off of auto rescale, but now I'm going to take it right down to the zero line again, right about there. Pretty close. I'm right on it. Now let me go be below it now. See now we're, I rescaled over on the left. So the current's rescaled. Now let me get a few more cycles too. But you can see how it's, it's, there's a little bit of a delay after it drops down before the next cycle picks up. So it's a little bit flat down here at the bottom. And what happens is that switching node bounces up and see five volts is right around in here. So it's trying to, uh, it's just, you know, flip around in the breeze, but it's averaging probably right in here. Let's go a little bit lower in current and just watch it keep falling. You see that? So that ringing starts to dampen. Okay. And then right here where it starts to dampen, that's probably pretty close to five volts right in there. And that's output voltage. And you can see how the peak to peak is got a lot of dead time now. And we're bouncing around because my triggers right there. So yeah, there's a more steady picture. Okay, so I'm going to bring the current back up to where it's just starting to stay con uh, continuous mode. And you can tell because the, now when the blue is jumping up and down, that's because the auto scaling on the left. But you can tell how square the green one gets, the voltage switching node. See, every so often we see a little dip. So I had to go... A little bit higher, about 240 milliamp load. And yeah, we're just about, so we're staying continuous. You can see down here, the uh, actual current coming out is just a little bit higher. So, um, okay, so that's, that's looking good. Now, now I'm going to go ahead and drop that voltage. And you'll, you'll see this voltage right here, the green, the switching node. You'll see this voltage drop, okay? Here we go. We're dropping, and you'll see, here I'm going to take that current off of automatic because that's kind of annoying, right? There we go. Okay, now you'll see that the on time is staying on longer because the voltage just dropped and the off time is shorter. And you can see how the current is a little bit higher now because it doesn't need as, it's not charging as high. Now, as I drop it, we're going to hit the point where the controller can't regulate. And look at that wave shape. See how it's leaning over? Oh, yep, we went underneath the 6.5 required to run, so. Okay, there we are. That's about the minimum. And... See it right about here. 
but you can see how the wave shapes changed. Now look how, because the voltage is lower, we're not required to put so much current through the inductor, right? So now I could actually drop the load of the, the current down to close to zero. There's where our minimum load can be where it's still running continuous. Now if I drop it down below, you'll see it starting running discontinuous again. You see what that looks like? Okay. Now I'll go ahead and take that back up. And you see how it's hovering 0.2 over here on the uh, on the left. It's 0.2 amps up to here, but the wave shape doesn't change as long as you haven't flatlined. You know, as long as the inductor hasn't run out of current, this wave shape doesn't change. It just floats up with the load. Okay, so my load's 0.34 amps right now. And you look down here, DC average about, uh, yeah, it pretty much agrees with my active load, 0.3. I got it set for 0.34, and I don't have that extra digit that I have here on the scope. So it's looking pretty good. Hey, you know what? Let's add the frequency. Let's add that to uh, channel C, the green waveform. Let's get frequency. There we go. Okay. Yeah. See, there's 200K, almost 200K. It's just a little bit lower frequency than uh, it's not perfectly 200K. All right. So now let's take the voltage up to, we'll see this voltage go up uh, to close to 20. You know what? I'm going to change this guy from plus minus 20 to 50 volts to get a little more headroom up here, okay? So um, I'm just trying to keep the current and the voltage at the same zero line just so you can see where zero is on both of them at the same time, okay? Okay, now I've, I'm up to 20. And you can see now, now we're having a, a little bit harder time. The current, because we have higher voltage, it's ramping up pretty fast, charges up a lot of current in the inductor, and and then we discharge. So we're just bouncing on the zero line right there. Okay, now uh, you can see how narrow it is because it doesn't have to be on very long because it's 20 volts and we're only putting out five. Okay, I'm gonna go a little higher. Let's see where the controller has problems. Duty cycle is getting smaller. Okay, I'm getting close to 30 volts. Wow, I'm past 30 volts. It's hanging in there pretty good. So, yeah, I'm up to, you can see, uh, I'm up to about 36 uh, volts or something like that. Right about 37.85. Well, yeah, about 36 volts. It's right here. Yeah, that's pretty good. Look how narrow that got. The duty cycle is about 15%. Yeah, it can handle that. Okay, that's pretty good. I'm going to drop it back down to... Let's drop it down to 15 volts right around there. Here, I'm going to change the volts per division here. Whoops, that's not enough. There we go. Okay, and I'll move that right up there. So we're right around 15 volts, and you can see how the duty cycles change to about 36%. And the current's just above the line. I could drop the current down. Now, one thing I want to show you is if I go a little bit lower, See, that's starting to hit discontinuous. See, some of those waveforms are are starting to run out of juice and then the switching node's bouncing up. So if I go up in current just enough to stop all that. Uh, okay, right about there. Right there, I think I stopped it. Okay, so now look at the current here. The DC current's 294 milliamps hey guys so i hope that kind of helped you visualize how that equation works fixed inductance we change your input voltage the duty cycle changes the uh, ramp time the current 
kind of changes based on that equation and I you know hope it gives you a little more intuitive feel for how that thing works you know the buck converter is not a real complicated converter but yet it does have some significant concepts that other converters are all based on so yeah it's a good one to understand and and I think just beating this one up you know gives us better understanding right I hope so <laughs> hey give the video a thumbs up if you like it that helps YouTube analytics and a big thumbs up to my patrons uh, really appreciate your support and um, oh you become a patron for a little dollar a month and I want to thank you guys for watching the videos and commenting below as well and all that stuff so you know what guys I think the next video what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the inductor and how to select it now when I measured this inductance uh, I did it with an LCR meter that's an unloaded test and so I guess I could have said well the loaded test is probably going to be 10% lower that would have put me closer in the ballpark uh, but I just used the measured value just you know just for this video but in the next video I'll show you some a couple different vendors what their data sheets look like and how you would select an inductor based on the inductance you want and how much current you're going to put through it and I'll show you what those waveforms look like and also so that you don't saturate your inductor you can't put too much current through it because it's going to build so much of a you know that current's going to ramp up until it builds big enough field and then it's going to saturate it's like a sponge it can only hold so much juice before any more you pour in it's just gonna run over the top of it right so anyway hey i hope you liked the video and let me know what you guys think all right thanks guys hey guys i hope you found that helpful uh now if you stuck around i've got some important things i want to show you okay these are really important so i hope you stuck around for this there's a principle called scaling well Maybe it's not technically a principle, <laughs> I mean at least well-known principle, but you can use the scaling principle in this, and I, and I want to show you that, okay? So it's kind of like Ohm's Law, right? If you say voltage divided by current is equal to resistance, well, if your current goes up twice, then your resistance must have dropped by two, right? Or your voltage went up by two, so there's a scaling thing there. It's like... If that moves by two times, then one of those other things had to move by two times, or a combination of the two, thing, you know, the other two things had to change. So same with this, right? If your voltage goes up twice, and if you want to maintain your current ripple where it is, then you're, you can double the size of inductor, and then that offsets the doubling the size of the voltage. Or, let's say you want to have more ripple current you want to meet that 40 percent thing because you don't really have a light load that's a problem you're always going to have a pretty heavy load so you want to design to that 40 percent ripple current so in that case you go okay that circuit works really great for me but it doesn't give me the ripple current i want well then you drop your inductor by the fraction you need it you know and so you can scale once you've got a working circuit you can scale these things by doing that kind of thing okay let's say you want to drop the the uh, peak to peak current by two but you don't really want to change these two things well if you have a control chip that you can double the frequency then you can half this time right here and so that's another way to do it so you can go half here or so you, you see what I'm getting to so I just want you to think about how you can scale these things and how they how that can work for you all right, so now the last thing that I want to talk about is controllers, okay? Just want to cover that a little bit. Now, the reason why 6.5 is the lowest voltage we could, that this guy was designed for, because that's what the control chip needs. It needs at least 6.5 volts to run. It didn't need that 6.5 volts to offer this 1.25 volts at the output. It doesn't need to drop that much. Now, the reason the 1.25 is the lowest voltage you can regulate is because this control chip, the reference voltage is 1.25. And so normally you'd have two resistors, you'd divide that voltage and you'd come back to set up your voltage here. But if you actually want to operate right there at the minimum what this thing's designed for, then maybe only just take a line from here and go straight to the feedback pin. You know, anyway, we'll get in that kind of stuff later, but 
that's why those things are and also it's a fixed frequency so if you want to do that scaling thing then this chip's not going to work another thing is when this duty cycle let's say if the voltage kept going higher and higher eventually it's going to start having a problem and what's going to happen is once this thing turns on once any control chip turns on it needs to stay on for a minimum amount of time before it can say oh the feedback tells me to turn off and this chip I don't I think it's like 300 nanoseconds so it's less than half a microsecond but you know so we're we were probably getting real close to that during that example I was giving you I thought I was gonna hit it but we we're probably getting real close I should have just gotten higher in voltage I think it would have hit it same thing in this case if your voltage starts getting too low now in this case it's gonna drop out because of 6.5 but now if we had like let's say 10 volts of the output then as soon as we start getting down to say 11 volts or something close to that 10 volts well as soon as this guy says to turn off he needs a certain amount of turn off he can't just uh, turn off you know instantly either so he's he might need 300 nanoseconds it's like three or four hundred nanoseconds that turn on or turn off on this chip forget which way it is but something like that so what it does it just means you can't go to say 95 percent maybe that or maybe 95 is the limit but anyway there is a limit so that's just something I want to throw out there about control chips once we because we're starting to get to the point we're going to start talking about control chips okay so just want to say that those are some of the things you think about when you're choosing a control chip if we wanted to operate at 500 kilohertz or 1 megahertz then we would need a real fast control chip and that's why this one operates at 200k because it's maybe not as fast as one that you'd want to run at 400k all right all right so hey thanks for watching and we'll see you next time